Thanks for coming back. Uh, today, part two of learning in equilibrium. I'm going to talk about extensor form games. Um, just to remind you briefly, this is how we model games with sequential and multiple moves. And the, the shift is that now the strategies will no longer be actions like rock or, or heads. It will be complete contingent plans that specify the action to be taken in every information set in the game tree. So these are strategies are called complete contingent plans. You could hand this off to, a, to an agent or computer it would play the game for you. Um, so the action you play at an information set can depend on what's happened before. So the actions can depend on other players' actions in an extensive form game. But we can think of all the players as simultaneously choosing strategies before the game is played. Okay? And uh, it's known, given an extensive form, and I have a couple here just to remind you what they look like, um, we can associate a, a unique strategic form, a set of strategies, to each extensive form. Once we do that, um, the definition of Nash equilibrium applies verbatim without any change at all. It's just a Nash equilibrium is a strategy profile such that no player can increase their payoff um, by changing their strategy, holding fixed the strategies of everyone else. But uh, the definition was perfectly well defined, consistent. It's less satisfactory in extensive form games for two reasons. One of which you probably already have heard about, and one of which you might not have. So the familiar problem is that Nash equilibrium does not inco ooh, incorporate predictions based on knowledge of opponents' payoff functions. Okay, so, and this is what led to developments of so-called equilibrium refinements. These are things that take the set of Nash equilibria, discard some, and keep the others. And the, the earliest and best known of these is subgame perfect equilibrium, which I was told most of you will have heard of. Um, so this is an important issue. Um, it's a known issue. I'm going to suppress it for most of this talk. At the end, I'll come back to a bit of how to add this in. It's sort of orthogonal to what I want to talk about, which is that Nash equilibrium and its refinements describe situations where players know more than is, is, is guaranteed by most learning processes. Um, and in some cases, play can converge to a self-confirming equilibrium that's not Nash. And remember the result last time, these fictitious play type processes, if play converged, it was to a Nash equilibrium. The whole issue is, would it converge? Well, now there's a different question. What might play converge to? Well, of course, you know, as I said last time, the effect of any learning process depends on what players get to see when they play the game. And I'm going to assume um, that each time players play the game, they see at most the terminal node of the game. So what does that mean? The terminal node is the end node. So here's an extensive form between player one and player two. If player one goes left, we end up here. Player one does not get to see what player two would have done had player one given her the move. Okay? So you'll, players only see the terminal nodes of the game. Don't see what opponents would have done. That means that um, when you think about players playing this game repeatedly and learning, they've got an exploration, exploitation trade-off. Player one might say, well, gee, I think left is probably the right thing. I can get two. But you know, maybe player two is playing A. And then if I play uh, middle, I could get three. Maybe I would want to find out what player two is doing by experimenting and giving two the move sometime and seeing what's going on. On the other hand, if the players choose not to do this experimentation, they get no data of off-path play, and so incorrect beliefs could persist. Player two might be being really nice and playing A. Player one might think player two is playing B, um, and so player one would always play left. Okay. Briefly, I, I won't have time to develop this, so I'm going to assume today that every time the game is played, players see the resulting terminal node, where we end up, the ends of a tree. I think it's hard to imagine how you'd see more than that, but there's many cases where it's interesting to, and sensible to think players see less than that. You know, for example, in a first price sealed bid auction, the terminal node is the complete vector of everyone's bids. And if it's an incomplete information auction, the terminal node is everyone's value. 
And you might suppose, you might think that when people play the game, they see less than this, that all they see is, is, is a partition of a terminal nodes. Maybe you just see um, the winning bid. Okay? So that's, a, that's coarser than the terminal node, less information. Okay? And I, we'll talk a bit about this at the, later in this talk, not for now. Something that's interesting and has not been much developed in the learning games literature, agents might observe the outcomes of match, <coughs> might observe the outcomes of play in other matches. So, player one pl plays, you know, it's a bit afraid and plays L, but she has a friend who's playing the same game, and her friend plays R, and so you could get some word of mouth or some, some social learning. There's a Literature on social learning and economics is mostly about technology adoption, things like that. It hasn't been applied to this kind of um, learning in games. It probably should be. So questions in this literature. What kinds of outcomes can be steady states of learning processes? Well, it depends on a learning process, so there's different answers. This self-confirming equilibrium I already alluded to, a refinement called rationalizable self-confirming, maybe Nash, subgame perfect, etc. Now, as I said, some sort of experimentation seems needed to rule out convergence to a non-Nash outcome, because otherwise people have wrong beliefs. How much of this off-path play is needed for each equilibrium concept? And different equilibrium concepts implicitly demand different amounts of information about off-path play. That's the question. Um, OK. So, Ah, excuse me. I, I should. Uh, I thought I let me. Good. I, I've added it someplace way too late. So fix the strategy profile. We have a path of play. That's the information sets that are reached with positive probability, and off path is anything that, given this profile, should never happen. So yeah, I'll be using that term a lot. That's, that's, <laughs> it's good to know what that means. Um, so we, how much experimentation is needed? Um, so that we can break down it in two bits. How much information is needed? And which information sets must, must beliefs be correct? And what kind of experimentation rules will give that information? So that's a two-part um, expansion of a question. And finally, how much off-path play will actually occur? in various models. How much will people experiment? To give you an overview of the literature, the first wave of papers on this, um, methodologically, what I would call boundedly rational learning, because they wrote down learning rules. They didn't derive them from anything. Um, and in particular, the, the key issue is, how much do people experiment? And that was hardwired into these papers. Okay. So what Krebs and I did in 88, we looked at a belief-based model in the spirit of fictitious play. Players have beliefs and optimize given beliefs, except that we imposed the condition that people experiment at rate 1 over t. Okay, but it's a lower bound on the probability of any action at any information set that shrinks to 0 at rate 1 over t. Why this, this rate? This rate, this is enough experimentation to rule out convergence to any non-Nash outcome, provided beliefs are asymptotically empirical in the sense I defined yesterday, that beliefs converge to the data in large data sets. Why is that? Okay, for Nash equilibrium, you know, we don't need every player to have correct beliefs. Um, for example, if if I did some complicated tree like this, one, two, three, and we have a, we're asking, is this a Nash equilibrium for player one to play here? Well, one has to correctly forecast what two is doing here. Two might misforecast what three is doing. That's OK. Nash equilibrium does not impose any constraints on the play of two. So all we need in this game is for player, if we wanted to say, is this Nash, we need to make sure one knows what two is doing. Okay. Well, more generally, it, it, we want to have correct beliefs at, quote, relevant information sets. 
which we define formally, but informally the idea is user information sets. We fix a path of play. Suppose any one player unilaterally deviated, what nodes could be reached if only a given player deviates? Those are the relevant information sets. Okay? And with this sort of experimentation, every one of these relevant information sets is in fact reached infinitely often. Why? Well, because we have a sum of, oh, there's a missing equals, but because the sum of 1 over t is what? It's infinite. And so we can appeal to a 0, 1 law and say, well, this happens infinitely often. So people get an infinite data set. And from asymptotic empiricism, with an infinite data set, your beliefs are correct. OK? So this is enough experimentation. So a lot of large numbers in asymptotic empiricism beliefs that the, if play converges, beliefs at the relevant information sets are correct. That's not to say that beliefs at every information set are correct. Why? Because the sum over 1 of t squared is finite. So we don't have a 0, 1 law there. So What's the, why t squared is relevant here? I missed it. Ah, let me explain in this picture. Okay? So suppose our limit outcome is one is one thinks A is optimal. He's mostly playing A. Experiments with B with 1 over t. Two thinks D is optimal, mostly plays D. But we can straight into experiment with C with 1 over t. Suppose that this behavior stabilizes, it repeats and repeats and repeats. Okay. Well, one is going to play B infinitely often. One will learn what two is doing. So it better be, if this is stable, that A is the best response when 2 plays D. Okay. Will 2 learn what 3 is doing? Well, 3 is reached with probably 1 over T squared. <laughs> so that's, and that's why it's relevant in this two-stage game. Now, if we had three stages, you know, we'd have T cubed. Okay. So now, there's an obvious fix here. If we wanted the rule that guaranteed this is reached infinitely often, Make this root t. <laughs> now we're good. If we had a game of length 3, make it cube root of t. So we, for any fixed length game, we could cook up a rule that makes everything be reached infinitely often. But your, your point is, is that if I want uh, this to be consistent with behavior, I only need to go one level past. For Nash equilibrium, so the point is that what I'm asserting here is two things. First of all, with this rule, any player on the path of play learns what would happen if he unilaterally deviated. That's claim one. Claim two, that property is sufficient to mean that if this wasn't Nash, we couldn't converge to it. If it's not Nash, it has to be that one could gain by deviating, and one knows what's going on. That's claim two. Claim three, we could still converge to something that's not subgame perfect, say, because subgame perfection, we'd need three to optimize, for two to know what three is doing, and two's not getting enough data about three. So this rule is enough for Nash, it's not enough for a stronger concept. Thank you. Sure. It's a good question. Um, so uh, please. Is one over t the best function to use? For what's what's your criterion? So if you if you have time average payoffs, it doesn't you know, you, you can put in anything that goes to zero and you're good. Um, it's a fair question. So where did this come from? And I'm a bit, I'm going to maybe not give you the kind of answer you would like, but my kind of answer is about to come. Okay? So this, this, this example is not, not to tell you 1 over t is the answer. This is saying it raises the question of how much experimentation people will do. And it shows how it matters. Right? 1 over t and 1 over root t were different in that example. Something that matters for you know, economists maybe more than for you guys, um, if we think of our guys as rational actors, maximum utility, they're not going to randomize at all. So the 1 over 2, which is, it's all sort of extraneous. This is, this is, you know, this is all crazy talk. If you have a non-perturbed utility function, you're going to have a deterministic optimum. Um, so, you know, Krebs and I wrote this paper in 88. It's unpublished with this version because we got cold feet. At the time, you know, the, the climate was not very good for models that weren't at least close to being optimal, and we weren't even nesting optimal play. So we, got, so we threw that model out and did something else, again, boundedly rational, but at least nested deterministic experimentation. So maybe that was a mistake 15 years ago. <laughs> but this, this is what we did. Um, 
you know, if people don't experiment at all, there's no data, and obviously we shouldn't expect Nash. We expect this self-confirming concept, and there's different papers that have shown that. And before I say any more about dynamics, I'm going to digress and just look at a equilibrium concept. So to get the dynamics, we're going to look at a game. I'm going to define something called self-confirming equilibrium. So we have a game you know, with players. It's finite. Nodes indexed by x. Information sets are h. Terminal nodes are z. Payoff functions depend only on a terminal node. The set of pure strategies, you know, for player i is si. Um, there might be a stochastic move by nature. If so, we'll put it in as a player, you can give her a strategy. Each strategy profile s determines a distribution over terminal nodes. If I tell you what people are doing, I can just multiply out the tree and see we end up with a quarter probably here, a quarter probably there, et cetera. <coughs> so players know the extensive form. Um, except they might not know the distribution of nature's moves. So we're going to have two you know, variants of this concept. Either you know the distribution, which is a standard sort of common prior objective distribution, or you don't, in which case we treat nature like a player with a fixed move, and people have to learn nature's play from their data. Beliefs for player I are just a measure over the opponent's strategy profiles. For a fixed strategy profile, I can, using Kuhn's theorem, identify an equivalent behavior strategy, which is the play at each information set, if people aren't familiar with this, with this language. I'll say that a player's beliefs are correct at a given information set if they, remember, beliefs are in this big space over all opponent strategies. Some subset of your opponent strategies you know, has, is doing ex some subset in this big space corresponds to the case where you believe your opponents at information set 7 are, act are doing what they're actually doing. So if your, your beliefs assign probably one to this lower dimensional space that coincides with what the player is doing in information set 7, we'll say your beliefs are correct at information set 7. Because that's, that's the idea of beliefs being correct at an information set. Beliefs are correct full stop if they're correct at every information set. You might have correct beliefs at one information set and not at another. And a strategy profile sigma is a self-confirming equilibrium if for every player i and for every pure strategy si that player i's sigma i gives positive probability, we can find beliefs mu i with two properties. Si is the best response to the beliefs, just like in Nash. You're maximizing your payoff given what you think. And your belief is correct at every information set h that actually happens when you play SI. So we could strengthen this to say your, your beliefs are correct at every H, full stop, and we'd have a definition of Nash. Best reply to beliefs, beliefs are right. So we're weakening Nash. Your beliefs could be wrong at some information sets. So things to note, if we have a one-shot simultaneous move game, okay, well then each player is one information set, it's always reached. So there are no off-path information sets. So this condition is equivalent you know, to the usual Nash condition. We have Nash equilibrium. So that's, that's the reduction. Um, the other thing that I want you to stop and notice is the order of quantifiers. Each SI in the support of sigma i could possibly be justified by a different belief. So we're not assigning a single belief to player i. So, it's not that we think player I is schizophrenic, um, multiple personalities. Rather, the, the, the reason for this is remember the story about learning is a big population. We're matching people. We think there's really many agents in the role of each player. There's many player ones and many player twos. Some player ones, like in this game, might always play left and never see what player two is doing and have wrong beliefs. Other player ones might play, say, write all the time and learn what player two is doing. So different player ones can have different beliefs if they're playing different things. We can define a restriction of this concept called unitary self-confirming equilibrium, where 
every agent in a given player role has the same belief. So that says for each S, it says there is a belief mu i for each i, such that for all S i. So we flip the quantifiers on the strategy and belief. That's a restriction. Okay. There's some related concepts in the literature that are also unitary that I should at least put up on the screen, but I won't talk about. Um, I want to now talk, I want to now illustrate how self-confirming equilibria differ from Nash equilibria. Okay. I was actually expecting something which more asks for consistency uh, between two strategies when they kind of lead to the same information set. So you can have different beliefs in as much as it involves different nodes you reach in the tree. Okay. <laughs> Does that make sense? Well, I'm not sure, but so let's, um, I want to th think about the case. So here, if player one plays left, we, we can agree that we can let player one have wrong beliefs here. So th that's what I'm doing. Let me show you a bit about what this concept does. And then I'll come talk about the learning foundations, how this relates to explicit learning. And that maybe you, you'll be able to ask some of those questions then when I, when I get back to the learning model. Um, OK, so here's um, an example where we have an outcome that's self-confirming and not Nash because two players disagree about the play of a third player. So the outcome I, um, I want to look at is where one goes across and two goes across. So what we see is that, big A, little a. The strategy profile that supports that is, say, one goes A, two goes A, and three goes L. Because we won't see threes play. If this is what happens, we'll never see threes play. So it's self-confirming. Why? One says, I'm getting one now. I could go down. What should player one believe? Well, let's have player one believe that player three is playing right. If one thinks three is playing right, one thinks one's more than zero, I'm happy playing across. How about player two? Two says, I can play across and get one. If I play down, what do I get? Let's have two believe that one plays left. Two says, OK, I'm happy. I'll play across. So both people are optimizing, given their beliefs. And these are self-confirming. Why? Self-confirming says your beliefs are consistent with your data. No one ever sees threes play. So self-confirming says you can believe whatever you want about player three. OK? Um, and this could arise from a Bayesian learning process. Suppose initially, player one thinks three is playing right. Player two thinks three is playing left. They both play across. They get no data. And in my process, I'm going to say, when you get no data, you don't update. So why is that? Well, one shouldn't update, for example, if one's prior belief about is that two's play and three's play are independent, then seeing two's play tells him nothing about three's play. No reason to update. And conversely. So, so this can be a stable point of a learning process. But it's not a Nash equilibrium. Okay? Why not? Well, Nash equilibrium says beliefs are correct. Well, there's only one way to be correct. So whatever player three is doing, if beliefs are correct, player one and two have to have the same belief about player three. And you know, if the weight that three places on left is more than a third, one wants to go down. If the weight that um, three places on a right is more than a third, two wants to go down. And we've got to put weight more than a third somewhere. So we're not updating despite the fact that we might get information that others have different beliefs than us. Yes, one. exactly. So that's, that's, that's exactly right. If you like, we, I can discuss that more. But if, um, um, now I want to allow for heterogeneous beliefs, which is actually quite an important thing empirically. I'm not going to show you an empirically important example. I'm going to show you a, the simplest possible toy example of the impact of uh, heterogeneous beliefs there'll be no unitary self-confirming equilibrium where half the time we see one go out, half the time one in and two way. But it will be a heterogeneous equilibrium. OK. So suppose we see half the time one goes out, half the time up here. Okay. It's unitary self-confirming. We need a given belief for player one. If the belief is that, um, to you know, always plays A, all the ones go in. And because two is being reached, self-confirming says you, if it's a single player one who is 
sometimes out, sometimes giving two the move, player one would learn what two is doing, would want to go in. However, suppose there's a lot of player ones. Some of them think two is playing B, and those guys go out, and they never see anything. The other ones think two is playing A, they go in, and they're happy. So that's a stable situation. So this is a really trivial situation. But um, as I said, there's, there's more complicated ones. Um, in many game theory experiments, you look at the data, you, um, it's very hard to make sense of a data if you require all the people to have the same beliefs. It may get much easier with heterogeneous beliefs. Heterogeneous uh, beliefs is a distribution of beliefs? Yes. It, it's, it's the, so unitary is all the people in the role have one belief, and the negation of that I'm calling heterogeneous. This means there's more than one belief in a given agent role. And uh, there is a probability assigned to it? Implicitly. I mean, it's not part of the construction. So, the, so if we go back to, to the definition, here's the definition. For each SI, there's a belief. It's unitary if I can flip the quantifiers. If it's, I can't flip the quantifiers, it's not unitary. So that's, that's the... Um, so in this example, note this is a Nash equilibrium and this is. What we're seeing is a convex combination of Nash equilibrium. So some experimenters you know, confirm Nash equilibrium by saying 85% of my observations were one of a Nash equilibrium. You know, but if, if you have 40% you know, here and 40% there, even allowing for some noise, you're completely rejecting Nash equilibrium because the set of Nash equilibrium is not convex. Um, in more complicated games, we can get things outside of the convex hall of Nash equilibria, sort of easy to see. Here we can get mixing where we couldn't before. Now we embed the mixing in some stage, and now we can get different actions being played. Um, empirically, this is particularly important if subjects have doubts about other people's preferences. It's hard to forecast based on preferences. So there's many experiments were, that are designed to make people think about you know, fairness or social type of preferences. In those settings, the experimenters don't know the distribution of preferences. How should the subjects know the distribution of preferences? And they can play differently. OK. How, what factors lead self-confirming to differ from Nash? I've shown you heterogeneous beliefs can make support outcomes that aren't Nash. Correlated beliefs. So I didn't draw an example. Let me do this verbally. Imagine a game where one can go in or you know, A or B. A or B gives players two and three to move, and two and three play simultaneously. Okay? And it, we can write down payoffs such that for any independent play of two and three, one does not want to go out. But if two and three correlate in the right way, one wants to go out. So we can get an outcome that would, wouldn't be supported by Nash, but supported by correlation. An important thing about this correlation here, in this model, players know the extensive form. There is no correlating device. So it's not that one thinks two and three are really correlating. It's rather a subjective uncertainty. Example, suppose player one says, I don't know what two and three are doing. Either they're both playing heads or they're both playing tails, and I don't know which. So that's not a product measure. Player one thinks if only he played in once, he would learn the truth, which is not correlated. But the subjective uncertainty could be correlated, and that can deter player one from giving two and three the move. So that's, that's a, another channel. And the third channel I've already showed you, inconsistent beliefs. That players one and two might disagree about the play of player three. Of course, that can only matter if both player one and player two can cause player three to be reached. If player one and player two disagree about player three, but only player one can give player three the move, only player one's beliefs count. So, so it turns out that this list is exhaustive. If you turn off all these three channels, you're back to Nash. I'm not going to, please? Heterogeneous beliefs different from inconsistent beliefs? Yes, heterogeneous beliefs means that a given player role, people have, um, there's more than one belief, say, in the player ones. So we can have heterogeneous beliefs in a two-player game, as I showed you. Inconsistent beliefs is that cons the consistency condition is vacuous in a two-player game, only matters with three or more players. So yes, they're different. Okay. Um, let me state a related and simpler theorem um, instead of this one. I explain it to you. It may have some independent interest in showing what's going on. 
let h bar of s, this is um, what I was calling the path of s, the information sets reached with positive probability when s is played. And I'll say that a game has observed deviators if for every player and every pure strategy and every deviation for player i, s hat i, not s i. So if we can get to h when player i unilaterally deviates and everyone else sticks to s, and we can't get to h if no one deviates, that's what this says. So we're in this set, but not in that set. We don't get there without a deviation, player i can make it happen. Then, if player i does not deviate, no matter what everyone else does, we can't get there. <coughs> what does that mean? That means if we get to this h, if we thought people were playing s, and unexpectedly we, we get to this h, we know what happened. Player i must have deviated. Only player i could have made this happen. If player i didn't deviate, it couldn't have happened. So player i must have deviated. Okay? Games of perfect information, where every information set's a singleton, like say chess, have observed deviators. As do all multi-stage games with observed actions. If you don't know what those are, think of repeated games with observed actions. Repeated prisoner's dilemma is observed deviators. Every two-player game with perfect recall has observed deviators. <laughs> because if there's two players, and someone deviated, and you didn't deviate, you know, there's not so many other suspects. The list of observed deviators turns out to hold in most games in the economics literature. It didn't hold in, in the horse game. Because there, if three got the move, maybe one did it, maybe two did it, three didn't know. So I can define what independent beliefs are. Each player's beliefs about the play of the others is a product measure. Just what you think. Okay, and the theorem is that in games with observed deviators, the outcome of any independent, unitary, self-confirming equilibrium is also the outcome of a Nash equilibrium. So in this class of games, all we have to worry about is correlation and heterogeneity. And not, and not uh, inconsistency. Not consistency, because it's not possible. Because inconsistency was, we both disagree about the play of a third guy. And that, that doesn't matter so much in, with observed deviators. So, and here's the idea of the proof. With unitary beliefs, for every player, there is a belief we can say it's playerized beliefs. With heterogeneous, not. With unitary, yes. Okay. With independent beliefs, these beliefs correspond to a mixed strategy profile. So let me stop on that for a second. Suppose it's a three-player game. One has beliefs about two and about three. From Kuhn's theorem, any mixed belief about two corresponds to a single strategy profile for two. Any mixed belief about three corresponds to a mixed strategy profile for three. But Kuhn's theorem is player by player. It's not the case that any subjective distribution over the joint play of two and three corresponds to a mixed strategy profile for two and three because of, there might be correlation. That you, and by, by definition, in mixed strategies, people mix independently. We assume independence. Now this works. We compute the Kuhn map for player two, the Kuhn map for player three, take the product, and that's our strategy profile. Observed deviators, only one player's beliefs about play at an off-path information set are relevant. Who? There's only one guy who can make this information set happen. Okay? So what we're going to do is change the play at that information set to match the belief of a guy who could make it happen. He was not going to deviate. Play one was not going to deviate if two did action seven. Let's tell two to play action seven. Now player one's incentive constraint is fine. One has correct beliefs. How about player two's optimization constraint, you might worry? Well, but two is off the path. And Nash equilibrium imposes no constraints on actions off the path. So we're going to change the play of people to get an, a different profile with exactly the outcome we were observing before, and now it's Nash. Okay, so that's just a, a whirlwind discussion of self-confirming equilibrium. 
And it's a Nash outcome. Yes, yeah, it's a Nash outcome. It's an, it may not be a Nash profile, but the theorem says that the outcome of any independent unitary is the outcome. And those outcome words are important because we change the profile while keeping the outcome fixed. It's, it's exactly right. Okay, so now we go back to learning dynamics, and maybe Tim will can you can try reformulating the question if it if it um comes up. So various learning models how it's self-confirming as a long-run outcome. So after Krebs and I threw out that model with the one over two experimentation, we did some boundary rational thing and said that you know, asymptotically what we might get to, you know, we we could get to any self-confirming equilibrium. Um, but so even then. So we weren't doing this randomization, but it was boundedly rational. And so economists don't, you know, don't like boundedly rational. What's sort of the, the, the most kosher, constrained kind of economic model? It's maximizing expected discounted utility. So, to like, so I'm going to um, tell you a bit about how to do it that way. So this is a paper with Levine from 93. First, I'll tell you what the individual agents do, and then I'll tell you about the system and what the, and what the theorem is. So there's many agents in the role of each player I. And they expect to play this game capital T times. That's, we call that the lifetime. And they try and maximize you know, the discounted sum of per-period utility. It's completely standard. And this is just a normalizing constant. So when I change T and deltas, it's, units don't change. Each time the game is played, agent observes only the terminal node. As in fictitious play, the agent believes they face a fixed time invariant distribution of opponent's play. So they think their draws are exchangeable. Um, they aren't sure what the distribution of opponent's play is, the aggregate. Now we're not going to make the Dirichlet assumption. It would be more general. The prior is anything that's non doctrinaire meaning it's represented by a continuous density function that's strictly positive, except we let it go to zero at the endpoints. Why do we bother letting it go to zero at the endpoints? Because we like to nest Dirichlet priors, and those go to zero at the endpoints. Okay, and then you update using Bayes' rule. Non-doctrinaire prior implies non-doctrinaire posterior, just mechanically. So the agent you know, has a bunch of signals and you know, actions. It faces a discounted dynamic programming problem. I'm not going to solve it for you. I'm just going to assert a solution exists. Finite horizon, discounting, you know, it's pretty plain vanilla, finite actions. So pick a solution for each agent. Without loss of generality, the solution can be deterministic. Agents don't mix. OK, so that's for now. I mean, I'll, have to, I'll have to say more about the agents at some point, but let me keep on developing the model. Let's talk about the aggregate model of everybody at once. So I'm going to assume there's a unit mass of agents in each population. Um, I'm going to assume a doubly infinite sequence of time periods. So I'm not going to have an initial condition. Time's going to start at minus infinity and go forwards. The overlapping generations. This is something common in economics. So there's this unit mass of players. So if t is 2, half of them are old and half are new. And each day, you know, the old people leave and a new cohort comes in. Or think of, you know, this is term just started, so t equals 4. So every year, the students graduate and freshmen come in. Every period, agents are randomly and independently matched with people from the other population. So in a three-player game, we make pairs of 1, 2, and 3. So the probability of meeting an agent of a particular age is their share in the population. If we have t equals 4, you have a one-quarter chance of being paired with a freshman. Um, Agents don't observe the ages or past experiences of their opponents. And all you observe is the sequence of terminal nodes of your games. And for simplicity, I'm going to assume each population has a common prior. So all the player ones have the same prior. I don't need that. I could add a subscript and, and complicate that up. Okay? So what is the state of a system? Well, at any time, there's some freshmen. They've seen nothing. You know, blank slates. There's sophomores, and you know, some took chemistry, some took biology, some liked it, some didn't. So we have the, the histories people have had in their four years. And, the, and we have the masses of people in each history. That's the state of a system. Okay? And given this state, and given these rules people have, which is what you, strategy you have when your history has been this, what do you do next year? We can compute what happens next period. 
that's a continuous map, so it's got a fixed point. Upshot, the system has steady states. Okay? And my next step is to characterize the steady states. Okay? That's, side note, the steady state thing might be a little surprising. You know, fictitious play is stochastic, it bounces around, and non-stationary. You only get towards equilibrium of the limit. So we, you know, asymptotically, we could talk about these, these steady states, which try along with here. We never got there. This system actually has steady states. Okay. What's going on? It's some modeling tricks that let us have steady states. And there's two modeling tricks. Okay. The system's deterministic. The individual play is stochastic. Where'd the noise go? The continuum assumption, we wash it out um, with the continuum. Okay. Now, fictitious play is not autonomous. The time steps are getting, you know, the more data you have, the slower you update. So, so it's, but it's, this system is stationary. It has a steady state. How is it stationary? Well, we have people learning, so this, that's what's you know, pushing time steps down. If you want to have a steady state and information's flowing in, information has to flow out. And these fixed lifetimes are a way for information to flow out. Or equivalently, now I, I said people leave, we could mind wipe them. We could keep the students forever, like zombie students, and every four years mind wipe them and they start again. So that's, so that's, 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 that's what's going on here. So what are the steady states? Well, for lifetime equals one, it's really easy to say what they are. It's people have a prior, they show up, play a best response, and leave, game over. Okay, that's really kind of boring, completely driven by the prior. An interesting thing that I have nothing to say about, I would like to know more, is what happens if the lifetime is intermediate, like four or 10. The reason this is interesting, when t is four, t is 10, there'll be some people who've been around for a while, have learned the ropes, and some newbies, and the experienced guys you know, might want to distort their play to take advantage of a newbies. No results. All the results are going to be the limits of lifetimes are really long which means there aren't hardly any newbies. It's, everyone has lots of experience. Let me understand what changes when I, I only face uh, opponents who are from the same generation as I. Good question. Um, let me stop and think. Um, and your generation is completely separated. Right? This is separated. So the question is, for fixed T, are there still steady states? Is there a steady state for newbies and a steady st state for the age two people? Um, I suspect that's the case. I'd have to stop and verify it. And then what are they? I have no idea. But um, yeah, I, mean, I, th I think this well mixed thing is more, more natural for my applications. But that's still an, an interesting question. Um, okay, and I'm going to tell you what the steady states are like. Something else I'm not going to tell you about that's an open question. You know, in the static case, I could talk about equilibrium was stable or not. We could have a, a two-dimensional system, a four-dimensional system. We look at a steady state, compute the eigenvalues, and see the ones that are unstable we can't converge to. So the way I've built this system, right, the state of a system is the vectors of how many people have each history, the longer the lifetime is, the bigger the dimension of a system. And that sort of dimensionality problem has kept us from doing any formal st stability checks. So the, we need some sort of kludge or workaround to squish this down to something finite dimensional to get st stability. Jason, is that a question? Or are you, are you... I think you were actually in part answering it. I just. Um... I didn't follow exactly the role that these generations were playing, and they weren't in your talk yesterday. They weren't. And so there, there's a reason you introduced them. Because the reason I introduced them was because it was, I wanted to say something about optimal experimentation with people that are Bayesian. That turns out to be really hard to do in this slowing down over time, fictitious play-like system, to, 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 to say something about the optimal rules. Here I have a stationary world. And I brought in the, the information, I brought in the generations really just to be able to have a steady state I could 
put my hand on as opposed to saying steady states are these objects off at t equals infinity. So that's so the overlapping generations were to have the mind wipe to get steady states. And that's, that's, the, so that's the extent of it. It's also a, sort of a, a modeling device economists are used to. It's used many growth in macro models. So that's, but you may see more in the, about what it's doing in the proof of this theorem. Um, any limit, so I'm gonna look at now a sequence of steady states for longer and longer lifetimes. Okay. Any such limit must be a self-confirming equilibrium. And the proof sketch has, has three parts. So if a strategy has a positive share in the limit, it's gotta be played a positive fraction of a time by a positive fraction of the population. If not, then its share would just be going away. Well, if a positive fraction of the people paid a positive fraction of a time, they've got a big data set. Okay? Most of the people who've played the strategy many times have about the correct beliefs. So why is that? There's two steps to this. First, the law of large numbers in a big data set, your data looks like the theoretical distribution. Secondly, in a big data set, your beliefs look like the data. And why is that? That's true uniformly in a rate, your beliefs converge to empirical distribution at a rate that depends only on the sample size and not on your data under this non-doctrinaire prior assumption, and that's a result of Viaconis and Friedman. It's a non-probabilistic result, it's just calculus. Okay. Finally, agents eventually stop experimenting and play a myopic best response to their beliefs. Okay. And if you're familiar with you know, um, the bandit literature, the Gittins Index for discounted dynamic programming, this should sort of be expected. You know, eventually you have enough data, you think I'm not gonna learn much more from one more pull of the arm, so I, I'm gonna play what's myopically optimal in the long run. There's a small complication here, we can't just point to the Gittins and be done, because agents know the extensive form of the game. So that means you might have a sample that you know is screwy. And even though you've played an action many times, you might still think, I'm gonna learn a ton if I only played it once more. That can't happen in the usual bandit world. Okay. But those are screwy samples and they shouldn't happen often. Okay? And that's, it's, um, I sort of have a picture of this here. You know, suppose that um, the data is a quarter of a time left A, a quarter of a time left B, so one's been playing left half a time, and half a time right A. So one has never gotten to C3 play. But one has played right many times. So the usual story would be, if I've played right many times, I think I won't learn anything from playing right again. But here, one knows that, that he and two are playing independently. He thinks two is mixing 50-50. He thinks if only I play right, I'm gonna, with probably a half, I'll get to see what three is doing and maybe it's really useful. So one should keep on playing right in contrast to bandits, but, you know, if, two really is playing independently of one, this sample shouldn't happen. It's, it's very unlikely, so that's why it's not important. That's an interpretation question. Yeah. So when I, when I say a theorem like this, I, I can interpret it as a victory for the equilibrium concept, yeah. like a dynamic justification, right. or as a victory for the dynamic process itself, mm -hmm. as a reasonable model of learning. Mm -hmm. Is there one you would advocate for this? Not particularly. I, 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 I kind of like them both. I, mean, that was, uh, I don't know. It's, um, um, I guess if I had to pick between the two, I'd pick the equilibrium concept. There are many different mo dynamic models I could write down that have this. So the reason for this one, you know, it's, it's, it isn't so much for the self-confirming result, which is comparatively easy. The issue I, I raised at the start was how much experimenting do people do? And to put some discipline on that, I said, well, how much experimenting will rational guys do? Well, if they're impatient, they don't experiment. That's easy. We're previous theorem. Now, what happens if they're patient? I want to see what happens. The discount factor goes to one. Okay. And this is where I use all this extra assumptions and modeling tricks to, to having steady states. Um, the outcome has to be a Nash equilibrium outcome, not profile, because it's a bit, bit glib in the slides. What we see will be Nash, the outcome. Okay. As I said, that was easy to prove under one or two experimentation. It's not the model here. Um, okay. Now, you might think if people are patient, they'll experiment with every information set. That's false and proof in a 
uh, later paper I may not have time to tell you about. Okay, that's false theoretically? Yes. Oh, theoretically. So empirically, I have no idea. I'll talk about the empirics a bit at the end. So moreover, so from Giddens, you might think, well, people are patient. They'll take all their actions a bunch. Maybe not one over t, but they'll take them as some fraction of a time, and we could do something. Even that is wrong. Okay? And that's wrong, I think, for an interesting reason. No matter how patient you are, a player on the path of play might never play certain actions. Okay? And that comes back to the fact that players know the extensive form. So it's not an independent arm bandit. It's a correlated arm bandit. Okay. So consider this game here. One goes left, gets two. If one goes M and two plays A, one is happy, gets three. If one goes M and two plays B, one is really unhappy, loses a ton. If one plays R, gets one for sure. Suppose one thinks, well, probably two is playing B, maybe two is playing A. What should one do? Okay. Well, if one's impatient, to stick here. Suppose one is patient. Okay. It's worth finding out what's happening. Well, the reason one wants to experiment is maybe two plays A. But if you don't know what two is doing, you don't want to play middle, because that's really risky. What you want to do is play right, see what two is doing, and then either play middle or play left. Okay. So you would never experiment with M because this is just a better experiment. So as an, fine. as an aside, I, I won't develop this, but people who are familiar with Kohlberg-Mertens and iterated forward induction arguments, the, the, this shows none of those arguments fit here. Okay. Because um, 2 weakly dominates 1. So Kohlberg-Mertens would say player 1 should never play right. And if 2 ever gets to move, Two should think it's middle and play A. And we have exactly the opposite conclusion here. Um, okay, so what did we do? We couldn't. We didn't want to say people play each action infinitely often. They don't. We didn't want to characterize the optimal rule. We did use an indirect argument. In the steady state, most people who use a strategy do it because it maximizes their current payoff. If they've played it many times, they, they don't expect to learn more. Okay low option value, at least for most histories. That's saying these are unlikely. If the limit's not a Nash equilibrium, that means there's something being played by someone that's not optimal. Okay. So there's something that's better. And we'll show that this better thing has a non-vanishing option value. So if you're patient enough, you would use it, and that contradicts this assumption that you wouldn't use it. So again, the proof is on option values without explicitly characterizing the, the rules. Conclusion is patient players experiment enough to rule out anything that's not Nash. That doesn't say that every Nash equilibrium is the limit of steady states. Okay? Um, and we looked at this in a game of perfect information with independent beliefs. Independent beliefs and perfect information makes characterizing the optimal rules much simpler. Because now it's not a, multi, not a correlated bandit. With perfect information, independent beliefs, the only reason to play an action is if you think it's good. You don't take the action hoping to learn about the path to a different action. Okay? And we can show that for some non-doctrinaire priors, no matter how patient you are, people off the path of play don't experiment. Why not? Even if you're really patient, if you're hardly ever reached, Right? There's the, the, once you take an action, it doesn't help you now to get information. It depends on how much the information will help you when you use it and when you get to use it. If you don't get to use it for a really long time, it's not so helpful. Okay? So uh, it says you won't get Nash equilibria. It said, no, this says you don't get all Nash equilibria. It says we can rule out some Nash equilibria. And I can tell you exactly, so in this class of games, we can have a, the, the converse characterization. The first time I said it had to be Nash if you're a patient. And um, I'll state the theorem and come back that the, so the, what you will get if people are patient, what you're, we can get for sure is these subgame confirmed Nash equilibrium, which is a subset of Nash. And what is it? To find it here. Say a node is one step off the path of a strategy profile, 
if it's not reached under the profile, so it's off the path, but it's the immediate successor of a node that is reached. So one single deviation would make it reached. Okay. And a profile is a subgame confirmed Nash if it's Nash, and also in each subgame beginning one step off the play, off the path, the restriction of the profile to that subgame is self-confirming. So it's a very small strengthening of Nash equilibrium. Let's skip some things and just show an example. Okay. So this is a three-player game, the unique subgame perfect equilibrium. Three passes, two beats one. So two says, I'll pass because two beats one. So three says, I'll pass because two beats one. So subgame perfect equilibrium, pass, pass, pass. But drop, drop, pass is subgame confirmed. So one drops, believing that two drops. And that's correct. Two is dropping. So one is correctly forecasting what two is doing. Okay. Two drops, believing three drops. Three, in fact, passes. So two's beliefs are wrong. So the play starting here is not Nash, but it's self-confirming. Two is dropping, believing that three is, is dropping. And um, yeah. So again, we're, we aren't getting correct beliefs one step off the path. Two never gets past two, so it never... The two gets past two, but so rarely that two does not choose to experiment. So two gets past two enough that one learns two's play. But in fact, two never gives three the move, so two never learns three's play. Two is reached so rarely it's not optimal for two to ever give three the move. Okay, so that's theory. And now some question about, about empirics. So how much patience and experimentation sh should we actually expect? Well, the discount factors and continuation probabilities in any lab setting is obviously bounded away from one. We're not going to be able to play the game forever. Um, so question for thought. I have no answer. In what field settings do very high discount factors and lots of experimentation seem plausible versus not? And also, to what extent can something I didn't model, word of mouth and social learning or historical records, give extra information? So even though no one player experiments, maybe in aggregate there's information. So these are important open questions that aren't known. Um, Okay, I'm quick, now I have to engage in triage. Um, so I could either talk about the effect of <coughs> how to add in the, the idea that people have payoff information. Well, let me do that. Fine, I'll just, I just I had two topics. I just, I just arbitrarily picked one. So, so far, the only restrictions on beliefs was they had to match your data. We didn't try to model the idea that you had some prior idea, well, gee, my you know, my opponent really likes chocolate. I think they're going to order chocolate at this restaurant. I've never been to this restaurant with them, but they always order chocolate. I think they're getting chocolate. Okay? Um, we can add in that restriction. We can, we, we can add into self-confirming the, the idea that people have some payoff information, and that fits with some data. Um, all we're going to have time to tell you the unitary version of this which all the player ones have the same beliefs, which is called rationalizable self-confirming equilibrium. Okay, there's a paper with Kamada, who's at Haas here at Berkeley, that extends this, but I, but I won't talk about it. Um, so this condition is going to impose some off-path optimality based on players knowing other players' payoffs. And the formal you know, definition is maybe not so interesting, and a lot of game theory really proceeds by examples. So let me not give you a definition, but give you an example where I will informally use a definition, and I think that will be m more efficient and easier to remember. Um, this game, sort of, again, it's a strange-looking game. It's not a multi-stage game with reserved actions. So small up, big up is a Nash equilibrium outcome. Two. I'm sorry? Up, up. Yeah, up, up is Nash. One goes up, three goes up, so two, two never plays. That, that's consistent with Nash, seeing that. Therefore, it's self-confirming. But it's not rationalizable self-confirming. 
even though I haven't told you what this is, I'm going to say it has the idea that players know each other's payoffs and they know other players' observation structures. And, and let me explain what's going on. So intuitively, if this is happening all the time, then one sees it happening all the time. One knows that two is seeing it happening all the time. So one knows that two knows that three is playing up. Okay. And one knows two's payoff function by assumption. So one says, ah, if I gave two the move, what would two do? Two could get one, but since two knows that three is playing up, two would play A and get U. So, so this is an example. So the, the combination of the payoff information and um, self-confirming has this conclusion stronger than just the intersection of the two constraints. Um, so one would deviate. So one would deviate. So this is not a ration, this is Nash, but it's not this rationalizable self-confirming thing. Um, um, good question, and the answer is yes. And I, that's not a consequence of any, anything I have shown you, but um, every sequential equilibrium meets this definition. Those exist, so, so that's, that's, um, that's right. Um, okay. One last example. Well, maybe should I, should I do another example now? Or, or yeah, so this is a refinement of sequential? No, I'm saying this is a superset of, it's a refinement of self confirming. It's a superset of sequential. She's saying, does it exist? Well, sequential exists, so this exists. This is much bigger than sequential. Um, uh, more with work with Kamada, I will skip. Um, briefly, very briefly, maybe not so much for this crowd, you know, economists are very into behavioral game theory, people making mistakes, mistakes in inference. So there's a, a literature that combines self confirming with inference mistakes. So far, our guys are like doing things pretty right. Um, so, papers that do this in game theory, which have led to some interest in um, models of learning in games where the player's models are misspecified. People have the wrong model of the world. Okay? Not because we think it's a good thing to do, but because some behavioral evidence looks like people are misspecified, like they think their opponent's play is independent of their type when it's, it depends on their type. Right? You know, their prior rules out the true states of the world. So there's, there's a literature on this, which I think is interesting. It's, it's in development, and there's actually two people at Berkeley who were linked to this that so you should know about. Um, so one is Philip Strzok, who maybe is there. He's at uh, Berkeley Economics. And if you're interested in hearing more about you know, learning with misspecified models, um, he'll be around all semester. So. And then also Damien Puzo in Berkeley Economics is doing some work on this learning in games with misspecified models. So if that's an interesting, interesting thing for you, you have two, two experts here. Um, so let me close with some um, open questions and problems. So I told you this in a very whirlwind. I stated this result for subgame confirmed equilibrium, which characterizes what happens with patient rational learners. But that result, I managed to avoid telling you, you know, only holds for what are called simple games. These are games of perfect information where each player moves up most once on any path. Um, open question, what happens in bigger classes of games. We don't know. I, I mentioned this open question about modeling learning in mixed pools of experienced and novice players. So the trick there is to find some interesting special cases and domains. Something I didn't talk about at all, you know, which you, you might have asked about, model people extrapolate between similar games. So impl implicit in this whole learning games framework, people aren't playing a repeated game. They play whatever the game is over and over with different people which we can do in the lab. And you can ask, well, how often do people play the same game many times? And my answer is, well, it depends on how demanding a notion of the same game you have. And at a you know, metaphysical sense, we're back to the basic problem of inference. right? If, if today is different than yesterday, you can't learn anything. You have to assume something in the past is like today to learn anything. Now we can be a little less glib and say, in games, so when do you extrapolate from one game to another? It's played on a different day. Played against a different person, but if, if you play a game with one Berkeley undergraduate, do you use that experience to help you against a different Berkeley undergraduate? Things like that. Intuitively, I think people do, 
problem is we have no real handle on how people do. And any sort of results on extrapolation depend on the details of the extrapolation process. I don't have any good, good conditions. I've tried occasionally to look at the psych literature on this and gotten, gotten nothing useful. Um, so I mentioned yesterday stochastic choice. I perturbed the exact best response functions with this regularizer nonlinear term to make things stochastic. Um, a fair question, why not do that here? If I do that here, and the stochastic terms are bounded away from zero, that asymptotically all my experimentation problems go away <laughs> because the, the, the noise will you know, make everything hit. Um, on the other hand, if the only time you play one of these actions is when the noise term makes you, that could be very rare. So that sort of changes the question from what happens asymptotically to what happens is the notion of intermediate run. So, so my conjecture would be that in this sort of world, we should eventually you know, get correct beliefs at every information set if, with enough time. And in, in bounded noise, we'll eventually see everything. If play converges, learn everything. It may take a long time. And I think self-confirming could still come up as a sort of intermediate term. You quickly learn the path. It takes much longer to learn what's happening farther down the tree. Um, Implications of misspecified models and decision problems in games. Okay, so I mentioned this 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 work with Philip. So thank you very much.